It's great to be here. I'm really excited. And uh, I want to thank Mrs. Bush, um, Dr. Bloom, and the Texan, Texas by Nature folks that have been such gracious hosts and share my passion for this. So I'll start off by saying I really love you all for the work that you're doing. I mean, just tremendous work. And I just want to give a round of applause to the prior speakers for the tremendous effort that they're doing. This, this presentation is um, sensitive. Um, it's not secret, but it's sensitive. Um, so I want to warn folks that really what my intent is, is to give you sort of who we are. As Dr. Frumkin said, we're one of those subpopulations that people often don't understand. Uh, they're misunderstood, and we're at risk at times for some of the things uh, such as PTSI or post-traumatic stress injury. So I'm going to give you a glimpse into who we are a little bit, and then hopefully a little bit, a few ideas uh, much in line with what the other speakers were talking about, what we can do about it. Um, so thank you, thank you so much uh, for having me here, uh, as this is a personal labor of love. All right. I'm a soldier used to telling somebody else next slide, so uh, i got to do my own. All right. So here are some of the things we're going to talk about. And I, I, I was given a lavalier mic, so I'm going to walk around like Oprah, but I promise not to sit in anybody's lap. Um, um, so I'm, I'm not representing the Department of Defense, the U.S. Army, or the Carl R. Donnell Army Medical Center. I'm just Jeff today. Um, I wore my uniform, though, so you can see who I am. And because uh, people say, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to talk to you. You know, it's almost like they can't touch you or anybody, you know, but, um, you know, so I want to give you a little bit of a sense of who we are. Um, you know, so, you know, I'm a white Jewish male social worker in the Army. You know, so, you know, when people say, how do you feel about something? I'll say, well, I don't know, ask the 55% of us who care about that. Um, so, we're, you know, we're a little bit of a representative sample of the United States, and we have the problems that everybody else has. We have the stress and, and medical problems that the rest of the world has. But we have some unique considerations, certainly. And um, as I said, this is sensitive. And, you know, I want to start off because I'm a social worker by saying what you do really matters. I even wear it on my arm here every day. Um, and, and, you know, I did this as a tribute for George Bush Sr. to put a Navy example up there, pain me, but I, um, <laughs> um, um, this is what, uh, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Commander McCluskey, and for those of you who don't know, he was a pilot in the Battle of Midway, and, and he was given orders to find the Japanese fleet so, you know, we could locate them and, and uh, pivot our Navy necessarily to prevent, uh, uh, potential invasion of the west coast of the United States. And he was up, about out of fuel, and he decided to exceed the zenith of his search quadrant, and in doing so, found the Japanese fleet at risk to his entire squadron. But in doing so, you could arguably say he changed the entire Pacific War. The little things we do, whether we plant a tree up here on the podium, or we, uh, or we do the things we do in our communities to make the lives of our community and our warriors better really does matter. It has a cumulative effect. And so um, you don't have to be a bystander. Like, you can get involved. You can do it personally and lead by example. Your children will see you do that, and you can pass that on through the generations. So it's a great example of how you can go from tactical to practical. Um, and anybody know who this guy is? You know, this is uh, Cy Sperling, the hair club for men guy. I didn't put him up there just because I'm losing my hair. That's from six years on the Beltway. But um, I, I like to say that I'm not only somebody who really cares about this, but I'm somebody who has suffered from it. So sometimes people say, well, you're just saying that you care about this because you're the deputy commander of a large medical center. And I'll say, no. If you guys get this right, you're going to take care of me, you're going to take care of my family. But more importantly, I'm a PTS sufferer. So here I am thinking I'm really erudite and you know, I'm 50 years old and I've got a PhD and you know, these fancy credentials that Aaron was kind enough to read off. But the fact is, so I give talks all the time and, and, and then it snuck up on me. I got escorted out of a bank my first week home. And I've asked my wife a thousand times, are you sure I didn't do anything in there? She goes, no, you just cast a shadow that made people nervous. I probably shouldn't say that with... Uh, Mrs. Bush's security in here, but, um, but, but the fact is that um, I didn't see it. And uh, so here I am, a, you know, if any of you ever taught your child to ride a bike, it's sort of, a, you know, something you fantasize about. And, and we left Germany for Iraq right before my 
daughter learn to ride. And in Germany, all kids ride bikes. And my daughter was very little. And actually, I have to even think about how old she was, which really bothers me. It's one of those little things that you don't find in a diagnostic manual that really irritates me. Um, so she was probably about three. And she comes home one day and says, I don't know how to ride a bike. And I'm embarrassed. And she was only three years old. But I guess in Germany, they issue the bike to you when you're born. Um, so. Um, so I didn't get it done. So I was so excited I didn't get this done before I left because I'm like, at least I get to do this as a dad when I get back. And so I was out there, though, like a drill instructor, ride the blankety-blank bicycle. And, and people across me like, oh, the little social worker's family is not so perfect now, is it? <laughs> so, so coupled with the bank and now this issue with my daughter, she's 16 now, still isn't riding a bike and actually brings it up. And it really does hurt. And again, you know, you're not going to, I wouldn't have gone to a therapist over this, um, but I realized I had a problem. So I went to a therapist, and without much diagnostic information, 50, you know, you're a therapist, you know, you, you probably know what to do. I'm like, I wouldn't be standing here if I knew what to do. Um, so she hands me some Zoloft and says, Has a nice day, uh, without much of an assessment. And I said, So I tried that for a couple of nights, and I'm like, I just don't want to put anything in my body. So I started running. And I ran 21 marathons since this incident. And, um, and uh, being out there with a cold air in my face, waking myself up in the morning, I did it today before I came on, um, is so imp much an important uh, part of my recovery. So there's a, there's a reciprocal interaction between us and nature. Lerner, in an article in 1976 called Developmental Contextualism, which is a little bit of a word salad, says that there's a, there's a, we're integrated organisms. We're integrated with the things around us. And in mental health, we like to talk about developmental milestones and developmental trajectories. But he would suggest that these trajectories can be altered by the things in our environment, both traumatically as well as in a supportive, collective way, as we've been talking about all morning. Sometimes, if you lose a leg, you're luckier. Not that I would trade places with any of our amputees who gave a leg for, or arm or both for God and country. But if you lose a leg, it's obvious. If you lose a leg, you're treated like a rock star, rightfully so. You lose a leg, people assume there's comorbidity with psychological issues, because no one's going to like that. And, and there's a, cha um, a chain of support around you um, because of the great sacrifice you've made. When your gray cells get mushed together and your marbles get rolled around, it's very hard to describe. It's very hard to solicit support for. And you don't even know what's happening to you. And I have to tell you, when I got escorted to that bank, although I didn't do anything, I was very embarrassed, confused, upset, um, and did some stupid things that probably didn't make me father of the year at that time. Um, but. I had no idea that I had crossed some limit to pain and transitioned into this wonderful journey we call post-traumatic stress injury. Um, and, and the people around you don't know what's going on. My wife told me months later, you know, the kids were terrified of you, you know, which is a heartbreaking thing to hear as a parent. Um, and it was as if, if I could just teach her to ride the darn bicycle, it would sweep away a year of guilt for not being a dad. Just that one thing in and of itself. And that's against the backdrop of what I've seen, what I've heard, what I've dealt with, the vicarious trauma of others I've been exposed to. So what the work you're doing to decipher this problem is so, so important. And what Texan by Nature is doing matters more than, I get choked up thinking about it, it matters more than you could possibly imagine. And that's why we're doing this call to action today. And I'm very, very proud to be associated with you. Of course, uh, there's well, good books about it. And um, you know, millions of people are affected by this. We've had our, now, even if you don't meet the cutoff, and, and the former president um, talks about why he doesn't like the D, and I'll talk, I'll talk a little about that. But you know, my area of research is on sub-threshold or subclinical presentations, if you don't meet the cutoff. And I was sitting in a room before I started this study with a group of my colleagues, and I said, well, what about the folks who don't meet the cutoff for the disorder? What do they look like? And everybody goes, oh, they don't matter. And I said, what do you mean? They go, they probably get better. I'm like, we don't know that. And in fact, studies show that if you don't address you know, in the thousands of international veteran samples that have been taken, if you don't address the re-experiencing cluster of the flashbacks 
Um, within a year, they go on to develop the full disorder. And one of our colleagues talked about a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot of time where if we get involved, we can make a huge, huge difference in somebody's prognosis. Um, trauma is also talked about as a disorder, a categorical disorder. Um, but I like to view it as a war-induced or, or whatever the nature of the trauma is, sexual assault, it could be any kind of trauma. It's an induced trauma spectrum disorder. We fall on this continuum. Some people take a knee after getting a hangnail. Some people experience post-traumatic growth, and they can take hundreds of licks. But there's no diagnostic three licks to the center of the Tootsie Pop, and you're bang, you're traumatized, Dr. Frumpkin. So, you know, um, I just picked on you because you look funny. No, I'm kidding. But, um, I, I, we don't have an M1, A1 crystal ball. We don't know. Um, how people are gonna respond. And we have all these different theories, but here are all the different presentations that people can show up with. And a lot of times, veterans will say, man, if you can help me with this PTS, I'd do anything. And most sick people wanna get better. And I say, well, once we get better, that's the easy part, then we have to deal with the grief and loss issues that ensue. And they go, oh, no problem. But then when they realize maybe they've lost a spouse or their kids don't talk to them because they're scared, they can't work, or they haven't worked in a long time, um, reintegrating and dealing with all those grief issues, in a way, it's easier than it's just stamp the scarlet letter of I have PTSD on me and I'm gonna hide in that. So what was once a disorder now becomes a layer of protection and adap adaptation to protect you from the pains you've suffered. I also wanna talk about women. Women have been on U.S. battlefields since the Motley pitchers were serving the troops. But this generation of women pulled triggers. You know, we used to put women in the back and the rear with the gear, we said, but in an asymmetric environment, there is no front and rear. And the women in the support roles were actually running, say, fuel trucks on the most dangerous roads in the world to run fuels to the guys in the FOBs or forward operating bases, risking their lives. And their experiences, while there's value in the previous experience of women, I think their experience um, needs to be deciphered and told. Um, there was concern that maybe women wouldn't get diagnosed properly. If, if you're hysterical, Cynthia, and I'm hysterical, do I get the PTS diagnosis and you get called a personality disorder because women, and, and actually the word hysterical is a terrible word because anybody know where it comes from? It's from the Greek root for uterus. So even in our lexicon, there's a bias against women. So I, I, this is a cause I've taken up for a long, long time. Um, these are extremely brave individuals and, so, and, and actually the best soldiers I've ever worked for are women. So um, their story needs to be told. The good news is the initial studies show that women are diagnosed properly. Uh, that was begun by a woman named Angela Pereira, a former army social worker. Um, and of course, there are lots of problems with returning veterans, um, but the good news is that most of us come back and are do okay. So we focus on the D too much. So there's something to be learned, especially when we're talking about other ways of dealing with stress that we could learn from the people who do well. What, is that, what, what are the things that they're doing that makes them different? And here are some of the numbers, uh, just to give you a sense of it. Um, so we, you know what, uh, Fort Hood, we're doing about a million encounters a year for patients and, a, and a 50,000 or so with stress-related injuries. And, you know, PTSI is nothing new. William Harvey talked about in the 1600s, the effect of stress on one's heart and temperament. Um, and in Vietnam, there might have been a need to pathologize that generation. So in some ways, the message of that we have soldiers coming back with these injuries was diminished although we started to understand that these folks uh, look different. And, and interestingly enough, before Vietnam, there was a lot of work with women who had been assaulted, and the, rape, the feminist movement and the rape crisis intervention epic led to our greater understanding of these returning warriors. Um, and these, I'm not gonna lecture you on what PTSD is, um, but sort of like this bike story. It's like coming out of a cave, you feel incompetent, and um, so you know, we want to make sure that we help people be competent, and this relationship with nature will allow us to do that. Um, why is PTSD not so great? Because uh, Solomon calls it a labile polymorphic disorder. It affects people differently. There are some cohesive symptoms, and if you have the full-blown disorder, you are more sick. And in my study, though, people who were, met the subclinical criteria of having the re-experiencing cluster plus one other cluster, but not all of them, 
um, actually used healthcare more than their full PTSD counterparts. And I didn't get to ask this question, but my theory is that they, when they were told that's not your problem, they searched for a solution. So their dental visits and OBGYN visits, everything was higher. It's fascinating. Um, and there's no such thing as a diagnostic yardstick, really. I mean, at the end of the day, if you say you're busted, I don't care if you meet the criteria or not. A disorder is when it gets in the way of how you live. So, and it's also stigmatizing. And, and that's one thing that Mrs. Bush and her husband have done a great job. I never thought, I was telling her outside, I never thought in a million years that this issue would be talked about in the military on par with readiness. But it is a readiness issue because it affects all of us. If we're doing our job looking over our shoulder, we're not ready. Um, so it's difficult to treat, um, but it is highly treatable, so that's the takeaway. And when, um, one of the reasons why nature is so important is it addresses this issue of social isolation that occurs. And these are, oops, and these are some of the risk factors that go with it. Um, number of deployments is important um, when we look at stress. Um, seems to be two or more is the cutoff. And, um, these factors also impact how well you do, and locus of control is huge. If you're there to help, you join the military to make a difference, and you're unable to really feel that connection to the mission because maybe you're inside the wire watching something take place on the other side of the wire, that's also very difficult. So there's, trauma involves betrayal, betrayal of trust, betrayal of your God, betrayal of your command, um, but there's usually some kind of betrayal. Dr. Cole's in the back, we're working on looking at virtual reality exposures where we actually create combat vignettes as well as natural vignettes to, to titrate their exposures back to nature and pair the previously adversive stimuli with positive stimuli in a safe environment. Um, so there has to be, because if you're taking them hunting and you're firing off weapons and, you're, and they smell the sulfur, you may be back in Afghanistan or Iraq without even realizing that. So it can, those triggers can be very, very powerful. So we want to understand the nature of people react to these cues before we put them back. But that'll create this sense of safety. That'll help them feel confident again in that environment. It's so important. Otherwise, they can become quite reclusive. Um, and then how do you describe these things? How do you, how do you come home? You want to protect the people around you. Um, you want to tell the story, but there's a problem with not telling the story. And this problem of military-induced family separation confounds it a little bit. Um, and, um, and so what's adaptive in combat isn't necessarily adaptive for home. Um, and, we, and I won't spend time on these models, but basically I have a mentor who says all models are wrong, some are just useful. Um, um, so you know, this suggests that everything will kind of go back to the way it was. But I like this model better where you're your, your family systems or individual systems moving through time, and it's like a pinball machine. You hit a trauma, and your trajectory changes. And we learned a lot about intergenerational trauma from Holocaust survivors, descendants of slavery, and so on, that we can pass this traumata to our children. And so we also want to protect the subsequent generations by taking them out of those uh, environments as well. And so here are some literature, and you've heard a lot of literature today. Uh, that suggests that outdoors, being in the blue gym is really important. And, um, and then there's perceived support versus received support. So maybe we, we have all these sexy interventions, but sometimes the perceived support is the most important part, and being out in nature gives you that intrinsic feeling. And, um, and off, assuages these different problems associated with isolation. And, um, and then there's the power of social connections. You tend to be more connected with your community when you're out there. And then here are some of the therapies we use. This is what a virtual environment would look like. Um, and I also use hypnotherapy, and, and mindfulness was mentioned before. So these are some of the things we can do that will lead the way to getting people to be, enter the natural domain and be comfortable. And then, you know, finally, the rest of my slides are just lists of the different funding sources that you can get. But um, I have Strong Star here, Dr. Donanville, who's a partner of mine at Fort Hood, where we work with efficacy of treatment chasing congressionally directed medical research money, and there's a great opportunity to fund research and prove that what we all think we know, and it was well articulated by the previous uh, speaker's work. So with that, I'll just flip to the end and say thank you very much, um, and I'll leave you with that. Um, um, but uh, I'm so honored to be part of this distinguished group, and ma'am, thank you again for having me here today.